Hi there, Juleika here. Before we get started, I want to invite you, yes, you, to be a guest on the show. If you're an adult and a child of immigrants, and they could be from anywhere in the world, really, I'd love to talk to you about the conversations that are necessary but challenging, especially right about now. So whatever you're all getting into, I want to know about it. Politics, money, holidays, marriage, kids, everything. So send me an email directly at juleika at lantiguawilliams.com and we'll get you on the show. I can't wait to hear from you. Hi, everybody. Today I'm speaking with Frida. She was born in Cuba, and she and her parents moved to the U.S. when she was a young child. As an adult, she's learning to navigate her relationship with her mom and to assert her individuality. She's also becoming more and more aware of how her mother's experience in her home country plays out in their relationship. Let's get into it. My name is Frida. I was born in Cuba and raised in Miami. I'm one of the co-hosts of the podcast, Take It Easy. And I called my parents, Mami y Papi. Well, I came to the U.S. when I was around four years old, and I grew up an only child with two parents. And those two parents had just finished going through El Periodo Especial in Cuba. And so it was a period of time of scarcity, very little food, access to food, blackouts all of the time. And so coming to the U.S. was very much a big experience for my parents where they, I don't know, they saw abundance um, for the first time. They would see me eating cereal and milk for breakfast and they'd be like, you know, we used to have to pick leaves from the backyard and stew it and that would be our breakfast and then it would also be our dinner with some sugar. So they told stories of lots of different ridiculous situations, including situations growing up and being like sent away from their parents and taken to Escuela del Campo. And, and I think that specifically was particularly traumatizing for my mom, who after age 11, she was not at home anymore. She was in a camp school. And I guess being raised around them is being raised around uh, two people who saw a lot of scarcity growing up and who also were raised in an environment that they where they were scared to speak up. Both my parents were teachers. Well, they became teachers in the U.S. Um, and they were both very, very dedicated to me, paid a lot of attention to me, but I think also were very strict and protective <laughs> of me as well. Especially for my mom, I couldn't be, if she didn't see me for like a minute or two, uh, she would think that like I got kidnapped or that I disappeared and would, you know, be scared of that. To to this day, I've it's been really hard to even establish any form of boundaries. I live far away from them and just being able to exercise, like not talking multiple times a day <laughs> is a difficult thing. Like my, my mother specifically is very, very attached and uh, over the years has demanded a lot from me, I think. And a lot of, I think I've had to, I'm responsible for meeting a lot of her needs, being her best friend and the best daughter. And there's just some expectations there. And I think that she always told me she didn't have that growing up. She didn't have her parents around to really parent her after she was 11. And so I just started to imagine that that's affected the way that she kind of has strongly attached to me. <laughs> I, I think that especially being the only child, the kind of light of someone's life, <laughs> and the reason they're alive, <laughs> the way that she tells me, I think it's a lot of pressure. I think there's a lot of times where I feel guilty about making uh, decisions where I might be spending some time away from them. Then again, one of the healthiest things I've done is, uh, I think, not live in Miami and live away from them, actually. I think it's helped me to be able to live the life that I want to live. I've had to assert my boundaries a couple of times, including 
not wanting to share my location at all times using Find My Friends. <laughs> Just saying something as simple as I would like to be trusted or I, you know, it's a boundary that I have. I'd like to be able to just go about the world without being tracked. And at first, um, deciding to not share my location really devastated my mom. And she asked for me to change my mind for several weeks. <laughs> she has dropped the subject since I think that doing something like getting married or having children is a role that she might respect more. I don't know if it's in Latino parents. When you get married, that's sometimes when they believe you've become a woman. Sometimes when you become a mother, that's when they believe you've become a woman or to, you know, mujer. And so um, the fact that I actually haven't done any of those things sometimes I think might make it harder for, I don't know, it might make it harder for me to assert myself <laughs> at first. <laughs> I'd like to still be respected as an adult regardless. And I think we're working on that. While I do not plan to have children or plan to get married, I do have some aspirations of uh, possibly moving cross country or moving to another country someday. And definitely at the forefront, I think about just how much it would hurt my mom for me to be even further away. And um, my relationship with her affects some like life decisions that I think I'd like to make in the future. Hi, everybody. Juleika here. We're living through seriously historic moments, moments in which women's contributions have proven essential to our collective well-being. But we're also realizing that our educations have largely glossed over the vital contributions women have made. Encyclopedia Womanica is changing that. It's a podcast from Wonder Media Network that introduces us to women pioneers, visionaries, even some revolutionaries from antiquity to today. Every weekday, Encyclopedia Womanica dives into the trials, tragedies, and triumphs of one groundbreaking woman. And they get it all done in five minutes. Listen to Encyclopedia Womanica wherever you listen to this podcast. For first gens, sometimes it's too easy to overlook that our parents are also going through a first experience. They might be the first ones in their family to have immigrated. They're certainly having a lot of new experiences living in their new country. And they're often the very last ones in their families to call their home country home. And of course, all of this shows up in the way they parent us. And of course, all of it also influences the way we relate to each other. To help us make sense of it all, I did what I always do. I called in an expert. My name is Rose Perez or Rose Marie Perez. I'm an associate professor at Fordham University School of Social Work. My area is on immigration, acculturation, and ambiguous loss. So you listen to Frida's story. What did you hear? I heard a story that's so typical of my own life, my research. And also I heard something that comes through a lot when I teach human behavior in the social environment to social work students. It's about the effect of context on human beings and the intergenerational transmission of experiences the parents have onto their parenting of their children. So this intergenerational transmission, is this something that is necessary, that is accidental? How does it happen? Absolutely. It's normal. Mm -hmm. You raise your kids based on your own story, meaning how you were parented, as well as the context around that parenting when you were parented, as well as the present moment. And so if you think about it, the, the context matters on the individual. The macro environment, meaning the whole world, for example, is experiencing COVID. Um, the world is driven by globalization, global wide economy. And that filters into individual countries all the way down to the mesosystems, which would be your institutions. What institutions would 
this four-year-old coming from Cuba have? Well, basically the family. So whatever institutions this young adult is facing right now, maybe she is in the workplace out of college and depending where she's living. We often talk about the number of co-ethnics where you live. So if she was raised in Miami with a lot of Cuban co-ethnics, but she's now living where there's different population groups, she's going to be impacted. She's going to be among non-co-ethnics, and she's going to look at her own life story very differently based on the current context. I'm listening to this, and I'm visualizing a cultural compartmentalizing that crosses generations. So the parents come in with a notion of self And then they try to transfer that notion of self to their children, but they're doing it in a completely different environment. There's got to be a lot of friction there. Absolutely. There's often acculturation differences in families. If you're a person migrating at age 80, you're going to have a very different experience than somebody migrating at age four or age 30. And so acculturation differences in families, acculturation refers to how you become, say, American. Right. In this country, we often forget the old country and we move to a new country, unless you're living in Miami and then you get to retain everything. In Frida's case, she did know a little bit about the context in which her parents grew up. But to her, it just seemed so foreign. So from your research, how does that widening gap in understanding impact the relationships and the formation of the self for the American-born child? Every child has parents that grew up in a different era. On top of this, she has parents who grew up in a very different environment than the U.S. So it's a bit of a double whammy for immigrant children. She's making sense of things and she's drawing heavily on her parents' unique experiences. Castro's Cuba, you know, the special period and Escuela del Campo. And so in the United States, we have a very different way of bringing up our children. And she's looking at her family as really different because of their experiences. But I think that the mother also has issues from her own family, right? She has fears. Um, that may have had to do with the communist system or the way kids and adults and everybody was treated there, or maybe it has to do with her daughter being an only child and she's scared to be in the U.S. Whatever other individual factors are happening, there's, there's something that happens within the mom. There might be some cultural aspects like filial duty, right? Like Latino parents are known to have familism, familismo. They're known to have respect. And how dare you question me, right? So the mom is raised in in the cultural milieu, and she also had her unique experiences. Hmm. So one of the things that Frida recounted for us was her desire to not be married, to not have children, to live a very different, very independent life when compared to her mom's choices. So how does the self-formation in this first-generation Cuban-American impact the dynamics long-term of her relationship with her mother? Cuban parents, for some reason, maybe is an artifact of um, their experiences with the government intervening for so long, maybe they kept their kids close to them. Some kids will respond with a type of identity formation where they don't question life and they just do what their parents say, okay? View it as an outsider, we say, boy, that's just the wrong decision, right? But to Cubans, that's the right decision. So I actually applaud Frida because she is her own individual. It might come across as a reaction, you know, against what the mom is trying to do. But I think she's just trying to assert herself. And I think the long-term effects of that is that she will negotiate a better, healthier relationship with her parents because her mother and father will learn to see her as an individual. She's setting boundaries. And hopefully she's doing because that's really what she wants and not just a reactive approach to this sort of control, perhaps, whatever the Mm -hmm. experience is for her. What a parent wants is for the children to internalize their values and obviously not 
not lose the kids. And so sometimes when the mother is perhaps a little bit too forthcoming in what she wants or too needy without realizing it, the children can, you know, there can be a backlash. Now, if Frida's parents accept her with whatever differences she decides to take on, and you know, we can have a lot of differences in our society, uh, things that some parents might find terribly problematic. And then it's up to the parents to accept that child or not. So it does tax the dynamic, at least in the short term. But it's a time where she can decide. And I think I think it's healthy for any child to decide for themselves. In the work that you've done, have you come across any suggestions or any actions or any approaches that work for someone like Frida, who is aware of this dynamic, which has some tension in it, which has some distance and some aspects of control? How can someone like her even begin to broach the subject uh, with a parent? The tension is very typical of families who are immigrant families because many times parents and children acculturate at different rates. So she came as a four-year-old. She learned English right away. The mother probably lagged and the father probably lagged for a long time. And there have been some intervention approaches used in uh, 1986. So Sasha who uh, teaches out of Miami, came up with interventions for troubled adolescents where he helped the adolescents to retro acculturate and help the parents to acculturate so that there was a meeting of the minds. Retro acculturate is, it's when you go back and appreciate aspects of your culture, appreciate maybe your parents' experience or, or, or Cuba, um, appreciate, um, the songs and the food and the culture of your homeland. It takes time um, and planning and maybe arguments between mom and others who are traditional. But if I think it's all part of it, I think Frida knows what she wants. And again, if it's healthy for her to assert herself, to to refuse to do gender choices, if she's doing it out of her own true wish and not just as a reaction, that is the healthiest way. And in time, with some softness, right? So my kids are driving now and they say, I want to go on the drive on the, on the highway. Well, they just have their permit. So I say things to them like, I'm not ready for that. And they're like, what do you mean you're not ready? I'm like, you were just a baby in my hands yesterday. You, you know, how could you ask this of me? I'm not ready for you. And I say it with love and I say it from the heart, right? So it's a lot of this has to have love involved. Mommy, I love you. I respect you. I know I'm the only child and perhaps you wanted me to turn out a different way. Please respect me the way I am. Thank you so much. Uh, This was invaluable. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you for having me. All right, let's recap what we learned from Rose. Remember context. Understanding the environment in which our parents grew up can help us not only understand their experience, but it can help us understand how they see themselves, how they see themselves as parents, especially. Go at your own pace and let them do the same. Developing a sense of belonging in a new country happens at different rhythms. Keep that in mind as you notice and negotiate the differences between how your parents acclimate and how you acclimate. And remember, be firm and loving. You certainly can and should assert your boundaries. But try to remember that getting used to them might take some time and effort from your loved ones. So keep that in mind as you build into this relationship with your parents. Thank you for listening and sharing us. How to Talk to Mommy and Papi About Anything is an original production of Lantigua Williams & Co. Virginia Lora is the show's producer. Kojin Tashiro is our mixer. Manuela Bedoya is our social media editor. Cedric Wilson is our lead producer. Jen Chien is our executive editor. I'm the creator, Juleika Lantigua Williams. 
On Twitter and Instagram, we're at Talk to Mommy Papi. Please follow us and rate us on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, or anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. Bye, everybody. Same place next week.